Welcome to The Way to Fly from Prism Designs. My name is Scoby, and with a little help from my friends, I'll be taking you through the course step by step. Now the goal of this video is to give you all the information you need to have a great time getting started with your new sport kite, and to build a foundation of skills that'll let you move on to our advanced video as quickly as possible. Now there's a lot of information coming up, so if you need to rewind, go for it. And as you practice, make a point of coming back to the video to check out the section that you're working on. Now before we get to the flying field, I want to make sure that you're completely familiar with your new sport kite. There are three basic components that make up a sport kite. There's the sail or the skin of the kite. There's the frame or frame set. Those are all the rods that support the sail. And there's the bridle. The bridle is made out of cord and it hangs in front of the frame and it provides a point to attach your control lines to. To assemble your kite, unroll it and spread it face up on the ground in front of you. Start by unfolding the lower leading edge and plugging it into each upper leading edge like this. Then stretch the shock cord around their knocks at both wingtips. You may find that the shock cords are tight, especially when the kite is new. If you have trouble getting them over the knock, try taking a piece of heavy string or a shoelace and looping it through the shock cord loop like this. You can use it as a handle to pull the shock cord up onto the knock. Next we'll put in the spreader, starting with the upper spreader. Be sure to hold the rod close to the end. If you don't, it's easy to slip out of the fitting and push the rod right through the sail of your kite. Holding the rod near the end again, plug the left and right lower spreaders into the lower leading edge fittings. Install the opposite ends of both lower spreaders into the center T. And plug each standoff into its fitting on the lower spreader. Always check to be sure that the bridles are clear and free of the frame, that they didn't get tangled around it while you assembled the kite. This one looks good. With a kite like the Spark, that's all there is to it. If you're flying a more advanced model like the Prism Radian or the Eclipse, it may have battens that you need to install in the sail. Battens either flex into upper and lower pockets on the back side of the sail like this, or they slide into a pocket on the front side of the sail like this. Welcome to Seattle's Magnuson Park. Now this is a great place to fly kites and in a few minutes I'm going to show you why. But before I do, I want to tell you a few important things that you got to know to fly your kites safely. Sport kites move fast, as much as 100 miles an hour. Now at those speeds, your lines and your kite could really do damage. That's why it's so important that you never fly near other people. If someone wanders into your flying space, they may not understand the danger that they're in. It's your responsibility to stop flying until you can get your flying space completely clear again. Don't fly anywhere near power lines or any kind of overhead wires. Both the frame in your kite and the lines could conduct electricity, so this is a dangerous situation. If something really goes wrong and you do get your kite caught on a power line, do not try and work on it yourself. Call the local utility and have them help you out. Also, don't fly in any kind of stormy or unpredictable weather where gusty strong winds or lightning could be a real hazard. There are just two more things to avoid when you're flying in order to stay safe. That's cars and airplanes. So don't fly near any cars, parking lots, or roads. And when you choose your flying field, make sure it's well away from any active airports. Remember, it's your responsibility to fly your kites safely. This is the view of Mount Rainier on a clear fall morning from the Kite Hill at Seattle's Magnuson Park. The topography of the Kite Hill puts this field above most of the obstacles that might cause turbulence in the wind. That makes it an ideal sport kite field in most wind directions. When you choose a flying field, make sure it's as open and unobstructed an area as possible, and make a point of learning to read the wind at your field. There are many indicators of what the wind is doing, but among the best is water. Since the Kite Hill here is surrounded by Lake Washington on three sides, the water has a lot to say about what kind of wind we're likely to be flying in. This morning, the wind is flat calm on the south side of the hill, but is beginning to texture the surface of the water as we swing northwards. You can see areas that haven't filled in yet, and the darker patches where the wind is stronger. It's still quiet on the flying field, 
As you can see, the wind hasn't quite reached the shore yet. But as we go even further north, it's filled in completely, and the big tree below the hill is starting to rustle in this morning's onshore breeze. By the time we're set up to launch, I'd guess the wind will be just about perfect. When you get to the field, one of the most important things to do after you've got your kite set up is to adjust the bridles for the winds that you'll be flying in. Adjusting the bridles changes the angle that the kite meets the wind. It's called the angle of attack. The actual changes that you'll make when you adjust the bridle are, are actually very small, just a couple of degrees, but they make all the difference to performance. Now there's a lot of mumbo jumbo out there about how complicated it is to adjust bridles, but the basics are really simple. Let me show you how it works. In the lightest winds, there's not going to be much air moving over the sail of your kite. So what we're looking for is a nose forward position. That way, what little air there is will hit the sail of the kite and lift it off the ground. That's the advantage that we're looking for in light winds. Now in heavy winds, we want the nose back on the kite. Lift isn't going to be any problem in heavy winds, and this nose back position will give you the stability and the tracking that you'll need to handle a high wind situation. On a day like this, it's almost perfect. We have about eight to 10 miles an hour. It's right in the middle of the range, perfect for learning. And of course, we're looking for an angle that's right in the middle between the two. Now, how do we make these angle adjustments to the kite? Let's take a look. Now, with a prism kite, adjusting your bridle couldn't be easier. You won't have to worry about picking open knots or getting both sides uneven, because we have a special machined fitting right here at the center tee that's called the bridle adjuster. It's going to let you adjust both sides of the kite at the same time in just a couple of seconds. To make an adjustment, you just grab the bridle where it goes through the center tee, pull down and back to disengage the current setting, move to a new setting, and pull up and forwards to lock it in place. Now with a prism kite, all you have to remember is that the higher knots are for higher wind and the lower knots are for lower wind. That's all there is to it. On most brands of kites, the bridles are adjusted by loosening knots at the attachment points and moving them on the bridle in order to change the angle of attack. Now I've set up this kite with that standard adjustment system so I can show you how that works. To make a light wind adjustment, we move the attachment point upwards or closer to the nose. That brings the nose forwards for that nose forward light wind angle. We'll start by loosening the knot and tightening it by pulling on the lower part. That lengthens the lower part and shortens the upper part and moves the attachment point upwards for light wind. Now for heavy wind, we do just the opposite. Loosen and tighten by pulling on the upper leg making it longer and letting the nose fall back for that nose back heavy wind position. Now you only want to make these adjustments about a quarter of an inch at a time. And remember, you have to make the same adjustment on the other side of the kite so that it turns the same in both directions. If you get confused, you can look for the little mark that most manufacturers put on the bridle. If you set this mark right on the attachment point, right on the bridle knot, then you should have a good medium wind setup for your kite. Okay, we've got a fully assembled kite and we know how to adjust it for the wind conditions. If you can find your line set, then we're ready to do your first launch. We'll start by putting the kite down on the ground with the nose pointed the same direction that the wind is going. That means the wind is gonna be at your back while you set up. Find one of the loose ends on your set of control lines and we'll set up to attach it to the attachment point on your bridles. We'll do that by making a lark's head knot. To make a lark's head knot, just put your thumb and your first finger through the loop at the end of your line. Roll forwards like this and pinch your thumb and finger together so they touch. And let the string kind of fall off your fingers and it makes a little noose like this. And we'll bring that over to the attachment point on the kite. Push the attachment point through it and tighten the lark's head like that. And we'll just slide the lark's head down until it meets the knot on the end of the attachment point. Give a tug to be sure things are secure. We'll do the exact same thing on the other side of the kite, and that's all there is to it. Okay, we've checked to make sure that both lines are securely attached, and we've got the kite on the ground with its nose pointed downwind. We're ready to now let the line off of the winder and get set up for launch. So I just hold the winder in one hand like this and let both control lines just kind of fall off of it as I walk. You can see it just easily comes right off the winder. 
Now later on when you're putting the line away, you're going to want to do just the same thing. Hold it in that same hand and wrap the lines around the winder like this. Okay, when you get out to the end, we'll just get rid of the card winder here. Get your hands set up in the straps like this. Okay, now some, some sets of line may be color coded for left and right to help you keep track. But even if they are, it's a good idea to check and be sure that your right hand is hooked up to the right wing of the kite and your left hand is hooked up to the left wing of the kite. To do that, we'll just tug on the right hand line. And you can see that out at the kite, it's the right hand attachment point that's moving. That's just what we want. If the wind is strong enough that the kite is blowing around on the ground as you try to unwind your lines off your line set, then you may need to stake your handles down first before you set up the kite. You can use a kite stake like this one or just a regular screwdriver. Either way, what's important is that it have a rounded end with a brightly colored handle. Stake your handles to the ground and this time wind out your lines downwind. Because we'll be controlling the kite from here, you'll need to go the opposite direction with your lines. Okay, when you reach the end of your lines, just attach them to the kite the way I showed you before. Pull the lines tight against the stake and set the kite down on its wingtips with the nose pointing well back so it doesn't launch before you're ready. Okay, we're ready to launch. Let's use the split screen to take a look at the flyer and the kite as we set up for your first launch. Start by pulling on the lines until the kite is standing on its tips, but still leaning back enough that it won't take off before you're ready. Keep your hands in this position out in front of you as you move your body back. When you're ready, bring both arms down alongside you as you take a step or two back. Bring your hands immediately together in front of you and guide the kite upwards to the very top of the wind window. Whoa, I've been pretty cool on this so far, but did you just say wind window? That's right. The wind window is an imaginary window that represents all of the space that's available for flying your kite. As you can see from this animation, the window looks like a half dome oriented downwind of the spot that you're standing on. The wind window is a great tool for explaining sport kite control, so we'll be returning to this animation throughout this video and in the advanced video. When you first launch the kite, you'll want to guide it straight up to the top of the window. At the top of the window, the kite will hang still, almost like a single line kite, with only tiny control corrections to keep it there. This is a great rest position for starting to practice controlling your new sport kite. The most important thing to remember in controlling your kite is body position. You want to be standing comfortably with your feet apart, ready to take a step in any direction. Your arms should be bent slightly at the elbows, and your hands should be close together, about a foot in front of your chest. Now this is really the only position that your kite will respond well from. If you spread your arms apart or raise your hands above your head, that's really just going to make things much more difficult. Okay, let's get ready to start practicing basic control. Starting from the rest position at the top of the wind window and using small hand motions, just a few inches at a time, try gently pulling first with one hand and then with the other and see what happens to the kite. These simple pulling motions are the basis for controlling your kite. When you pull with one hand, it pulls on the wing that that line is attached to and the kite begins a turn in the direction of that wing. When you return your hand to a neutral position with both hands together again, the kite stops its turn and begins to fly straight again. Try the same motions again, this time making them slightly larger. Pull and return to neutral, then pull with the other hand and return to neutral. You can see that the kite turns more sharply with these larger motions. The next thing we're going to work on is flying the kite further back and forth in the top of the wind window. And in order to do this, you'll need to learn to fly the kite sideways in both directions. We'll start at the center of the wind window near the top. Pull with your left hand until the kite begins to point left. Now with the kite pointed left, return your hands to neutral. When the hands are next to each other in the neutral position, the kite flies straight, in this case straight to the left. As the kite gets near the left edge of the window, make a right pull to turn back in the other direction. 
when the kite is pointed right, return to neutral and guide the kite straight to the right. As you near the edge of the window again, pull left this time until the kite is facing left, then return to neutral to guide the kite across the window to the left. You'll want to practice this back and forth pattern until it gets familiar and easy. Let's take a look at the same pattern without any stops. Here's the pull, return to neutral, pull and return to neutral to fly straight, pull and return to neutral. Okay, okay, back and forth is cool, but how about like doing like a circle, you know, all the way around? That's next. If you pull on one control line and keep it there, the cut will turn all the way around. As a matter of fact, it'll keep turning until you return to neutral position. We're going to start by doing just one loop at a time. Begin at the top of the window again and make a medium-sized pull to the right. Maintain the pull until the loop that you're steering is at about the 8 o'clock position. Then begin to return to neutral as the kite returns to the very top of the window. Pull, maintain, and return to neutral. Pull, maintain, and return to neutral. But Kite did. I was doing these loops, and my lines were getting all crossed around each other, and I was trying to keep up with them, and it was totally hard to fly. Have you ever tried flying like this? Don't worry too much about the twists in your line. Your right hand is still connected to the right wing of your kite, and your left hand still connected to the left side. A good quality line set doesn't have much friction to it, so even with a few twists, you're going to be able to control your kite just fine. And once you learn to do loops and spins, you'll be able to unwind your kite just by flying. The next thing to try is two full loops in each direction. Let's look at loops to the right to start with. Pull right, maintain for one full loop, two full loops, and then from the 8 o'clock position again, return to neutral. Now left, one, two, and return to neutral, right? One, two, and return to neutral. If you make your loop using a large motion like this, then the kite will be turning sharply and the loop you make will be really small. If you make your loop using just a small motion, then the kite isn't turning that much and the loop you make will be large. To get the best control of your kite, you're going to want to practice making every size of loop. As you get comfortable with these basic maneuvers, you'll want to learn to do them closer and closer to the ground. With practice, you'll be doing spins right in the power zone. Too cool! Spins in the power zone! What's a power zone? The power zone is the part of the window where the wind on your kite is the strongest. The power zone is located directly downwind near the center of the wind window. As you fly from one edge of the window to the other, the kite speeds up and pulls harder in the power zone. The closer you are to flying in the power zone, the more responsive your kite will be to your control motions. Out at the edges, away from the power zone, it's a different story. You may notice that out at the edge of the wind window, the controls feel softer. You might even have to exaggerate your hand motions in order to complete your maneuvers. Okay, I get that, but check this out. Yesterday when I was flying, I had my kite out at the edge of the wind window, and it totally went backwards. Explain that, kite dude. Okay, here's the deal. When the wind changes, so does the size and the shape of the window that you're flying in. In big wind, the window is at its maximum size and your kite will fly all the way out to the edge. But if the wind decreases while you're at the edge, the window gets smaller and your kite will shift back to the window's new edge. When the wind gets stronger again, the window will get wider again and the kite will be supported further out on the edge. The same thing can happen if the kite is at the top of the window. If the wind decreases with the kite at the top of the window, the kite will fall back as the window shrinks back. If the wind comes up again, the window will grow to full size again and the kite will be supported higher in the sky. When you're first learning, the best thing to do when you lose the wind like this is nothing at all. Just let the kite float back in the sky again until it reaches a part of the window where you feel pull and have control again. If you notice your control lines going slack as the kite falls back, you can take a few steps back to keep your lines ready to control the kite when you reach the edge of the window again. Getting comfortable handling your kite when it isn't powered up like this is great practice for when you learn to do stalls later on as you become a more advanced flyer. 
Now we've seen how the wind window changes when the wind speed changes. What about when the wind changes direction? It's normal for the wind's direction to shift from time to time as you fly. The wind window's location is dependent on the wind direction. So if the wind direction changes, the window moves to match it. As you can see, your kite may shift back if it's out at the edge when this happens. Now we see the wind direction shifting back again, the window changes with it, and the kite is supported higher at the edge again. If you keep track of these changes in the wind as you fly, then what your kite's doing out at the end of the lines will start to make a lot more sense. Now I'm going to show you a maneuver that you'll probably do a lot as you're getting started. The standard reaction to this situation is to pull on both your lines really hard, and that's just going to drive your kite into the ground even harder. If you can, it's a good idea instead to throw your arms forward a little bit, loosen up the pressure on the kite, and then it won't hit the ground as hard. The best thing to do, of course, is to learn how to avoid a crash altogether, and that's what we're going to talk about next. All you have to do to steer your way out of a crash is to make a turn with the kite. When the kite's pointing straight at the ground, any turn is a turn away from the ground. And we know from studying basic control that turning involves pulling one control line or pulling the other, which one doesn't really matter because we can recover to the left or we can recover to the right. Either one will get us out of a sticky situation. Let's see if we can't help out our friend here by making a pull to the right and recovering from his crash. Here's the pull. The kite recovers by making a turn to the kite's right side. Return to neutral as the kite begins to point upwards again. Let's take a look at that without any interruption. The only way to make recovering from a crash completely automatic is to practice it. You want to go out on a light wind day when there isn't any risk of doing damage to your kite and steer the kite straight at the ground and then pull out. Make your recoveries closer and closer to the ground. Once you get comfortable with this technique, you'll almost never crash your kite. Now that you know how to avoid landing by mistake, you'll be able to keep your kite in the air forever. But at some point, you'll want to go home. Let's take a look at a way to land your kite that'll get it down onto the ground safely no matter how hard the wind is blowing. Just bring the kite to the top of the window and make a tiny pull to start the kite turning, in this case to the left. Maintain just slightly more tension on the left line as the kite rides down the left edge of the window. As the kite nears the ground, you can gently roll the kite onto its leading edge for the landing. Okay, let's take a look at that same landing on the double screen. Just a tiny pull to the left. By controlling the amount you pull, you can control exactly how fast the kite comes down. And there's the landing. Flying your kite all the way across the window from one side to the other with the wingtip just a couple of feet or even just a couple of inches off the ground is called a ground pass. And as you get more comfortable flying low in the window, you're definitely going to want to learn how to do it. It always looks impressive and it'll really hone your timing and accuracy. This is the same sequence we used earlier to show you how to fly sideways back and forth near the top of the window. That's because flying a ground pass is the same maneuver, just lower down in the window. Start with this back and forth exercise and let it get lower and lower until your passes are just a few feet off the ground. As you make your ground pass, you may find that it helps your control to bring one hand over the other. That way your hands match the wings as your kite flies from one side of the window to the other. It helps to pretend that the horizon is the ground. You can use it as a reference to practice flying straight. It'll give you a little bit more room to make mistakes so you won't crash your kite as often as you practice. Just line up your wingtip visually with the line of the horizon and see how steady you can keep the kite as it cruises across the window. As you're working on ground passes, you'll notice that most of your turns are upwards away from the ground. This turn always feels easier and safer because the kite never actually points at the ground during the turn. But it can be a lot more dramatic to turn the kite downwards at the end of a ground pass. Let's take a look at that on the double screen. As the kite makes its way across the window to the left, this is the point where we would ordinarily pull right to turn upwards for another pass. By pulling left instead at this point, we can turn the kite downwards for another pass. Here's the pull, and return to neutral as the kite is pointed right for a nice low pass to the other edge. It's important to leave enough room below the kite to make a downwards turn. If your ground pass is low, you'll need to turn upwards first before making that downwards turn. Now here's a nice low ground pass. 
If we turn down now as we near the edge, the kite would be eating some dirt in a big hurry. So instead we pull right to turn the kite upwards, then left to bring it around, then return to neutral for the next low pass. Let's take a look at it at full speed. Here's the right pull to clear the ground, left pull to turn, and return to neutral for the ground pass. Now that we know how to make ground passes, let's try using one to make a landing. This is a great second landing to learn because it ends with the kite resting on its wingtips and ready to relaunch. To do this landing, make a nice low ground pass from left to right. As the kite reaches the edge of the window and begins to slow down, pull the left control line until the kite is pointed up but barely moving. Return to neutral and take a few steps forward, extending your arms in front of you, and let the kite settle to the ground on its tips. When you reach the edge of the window, the kite doesn't have much power. Walking forwards at that point gives the kite even less wind, and that's what allows it to float back onto the ground. Let's take one more look. Next, we're going to try a more advanced version of this same landing. It's called the spin landing. To do the spin landing, fly across the window from right to left. As you reach the edge, pull hard right to spin the kite one full rotation just above the ground. Return to neutral with a sharp motion and walk forward to settle the kite onto the ground. It's going to take some practice to perfect your timing, but the spin landing can actually make it easier to land. The tight spin that you do just before the kite touches down takes some of the power out of the sail and makes it easier to float the kite onto the ground. Both of the landings we just looked at are great preparation for a maneuver called the tip stand. The tip stand is a basic part of any competitor's bag of tricks, and it'll serve as a great foundation for some of the things we're going to teach you in the advanced video. Start with the kite in launch position, but instead of launching, tug gently on one wing. This tug will, in effect, launch only that wing, rocking the kite onto the opposite tip and starting the tip stand. Starting a tip stand is easy, but maintaining it takes some practice, especially if the wind is gusty like it is this afternoon. At first, you'll use the upper control line to do most of the work balancing the tip stand. But as you can see here, the lower hand also comes into play, especially if the kite begins to roll over onto its nose. Before we wrap things up, we're going to cover one more critical skill. The punch turn is important for two reasons. First, it'll let you perfect your precision flying. Precision flying is all about flying perfect geometrical shapes in the wind window. Second, it's one of the key stepping stones to the most important maneuvers that we're going to show you in the advanced video. Precision flying calls for the kind of crisp, instantaneous turns that we were just watching. The only way to get turns like that is by using the punch turn technique. Now all the turns we've looked at so far in the video involve pulling on one control line and then releasing when you want to stop turning. The punch turn, as you probably already guessed, involves releasing a control line, the opposite control line, and then returning to neutral. So to make a left hand punch turn, we'd make a punching motion with the right hand, like this. The best way to practice punch turns is to work on flying perfect squares in the wind window. To make right hand square turns, you'll be punching with your left hand. Once the kite is about three quarters of the way to the top of the window, make four punches with your left hand. One, two, three, four, then right hand, two, three, four. Keep alternating until your squares are as crisp and perfect as possible. The exact distance that your hand moves during the punch the speed of the punch and the speed of the return to neutral are all critical to making a perfect punch turn. Practice in different conditions so that your punch turns become automatic. If you practice and master all the techniques and concepts that we've talked about in The Way to Fly, you'll have a solid foundation for moving on to our advanced video and building world-class flying skills. So let's close by taking a look at some of the maneuvers that are covered in the latest video from Prism Designs, The Advanced Way to Fly.